A crucial problem facing socialists is what Marxist scholars Al Campbell and Mehmet Tutin term the chicken and egg problem of socialist transformation. The problem begins with the fact that socialists aim to bring about a society based on the democratic self-management of workplaces and communities. Therefore, both the abolition of capitalism in favour of socialism and the day-to-day -day reproduction of socialism requires the bulk of the population to be self-determining people who decide to, and are able to, collectively take control of, and self-manage, the social, political, and economic dimensions of society. Capitalism, however, produces people fit for the reproduction of capitalism rather than its abolition. This can be seen in how work is organised under capitalism. The central type of labour under capitalism is wage labour. This takes the form of workers selling their labour to a capitalist in exchange for a wage. Through doing so they enter into economic relations in which the capitalist determines what they produce and how they produce it. How the capitalist decides the workplace and its division of labour should be organised shapes how workers spend their day and so the conditions under which they complete tasks, what tasks they complete and how they complete them. This in turn shapes what capacities and psychological drives workers develop and which ones they do not develop. Work is not merely something which the worker does, but is also something which changes the worker as they are doing it. As a result, workers are not only transferring to capitalists control over their ability to labour, but are additionally transferring control over how they as people are developed over time. Since the capitalist and managers monopolise the tasks of making decisions and planning production, the workers develop the ability to complete tasks allocated to them, rather than the ability to determine for themselves what tasks they complete. Or since the capitalist organises production in such a way that workers must perform the same basic and repetitive tasks at high speed, the workers develop their capacities to keep up with this rapid pace of work and perform the same dull tasks as quickly as possible. The consequence of this is that workers do not develop the individual and collective capacities and psychological drives which are needed for workers to both want to and be able to collectively self-manage production. Wage labour produces workers who are not fit for the task which anti-capitalists have given them self-organising the abolition of capitalism and its replacement by democratic self-management. This process of capitalism producing people who reproduce capitalism is not unique to the workplace, but occurs throughout capitalist society. For example, the perpetual daily experience of capitalism makes features of capitalism appear to people as normal and natural in the same way that weather is. This has the effect that the drive to abolish capitalism does not develop because any alternative to capitalism seems impossible and unrealisable. As Marx notes, the advance of capitalist production develops a working class which by education, training and habit looks upon the requirements of that mode of production as self-evident natural laws. The result is that, quote, it is easier to imagine the end of the world than to imagine the end of capitalism. Self-determining people would be produced by a properly functioning socialist society. After all, how people within a socialist society develop would be shaped by the institutions that they spend their day in. Since they would spend their time in institutions which are based on individual and collective self-determination, they would develop into self-determining people. These are just the kinds of people needed for revolution. Unfortunately, we live under capitalism, not socialism. We thus have a problem. In order to transform society, one needs transformed people. In order to have transformed people, one needs a new society. How then can socialism be achieved? The most promising answer to this problem is revolutionary practice, which Marx defined as, quote, the coincidence of the changing of circumstances and of human activity, or self-changing. This refers to the process whereby people engaged in social struggle 
simultaneously change not only themselves, but also social relations through their own collective activity. For example, a successful strike changes social relations, wages increase and workers gain more power over management, and changes agents. Workers have an increased sense of solidarity with one another and the knowledge of how to organise a strike. Thus, people socialised under capitalism can transform themselves into the people needed for creating socialism through the struggle against capitalism itself. One of the most important kinds of revolutionary practice is prefiguration. Prefiguration refers to the process of social movements attempting, as far as is possible, to construct the world as they wish it was during their struggle against the world as it is. One of the earliest statements of this idea is the Saint Villiers Circular of 1871, which states that, quote, The society of the future should be nothing other than the universalization of the organization with which the international will have endowed itself. We must, therefore, have to care to ensure that that organization comes as close as we may to our ideal. How can we expect an egalitarian and free society to emerge from an authoritarian organization? Impossible. The international, as the embryo of the human society of the future, is required in the here and now to faithfully mirror our principles of freedom and federation and shun any principles leaning towards authority and dictatorship. A more condensed expression of this view can be seen in the IWW's famous commitment to, quote, forming the structure of the new society within the shell of the old. To prefigure socialism is therefore to attempt to create, in the here and now, the kinds of non-hierarchical and democratic social relations and practices which would exist in such a society. Such prefigurative spaces are sites of the kind of self-change envisioned by Marx. As people live within and experience prefigurative spaces, they develop the kinds of capacities which they would develop were they raised in an actual socialist society. For example, people learn to make decisions democratically, learn to compromise with people they disagree with, and learn how to facilitate meetings. As people learn new capacities, they also simultaneously transform and develop their psychological drives. For example, people may find themselves wanting to make as many decisions as possible democratically, such as using consensus decision-making procedures when ordering pizza with friends. These kinds of tangible experiences of real democracy in turn transform people's understanding of the world, such as a person coming to realise that there are workable alternatives to minority rule, and that a socialist society is possible.